defender of liberty. You see, freedom is worth fighting for. We know that as a nation. But also, spiritual freedom, more importantly, is worth fighting for. We refer to those who defend and fight for freedoms or equalities as freedom fighters. Often we believe that our generation is the greatest. We're the ones who started this whole thing on social activism. It's just not true. This has also been highlighted in the most recent film uh, titled The Sound of Freedom. How we like to get in there and fight for those who are living under bondage to injustice. And that pleases the Lord. But to be a freedom fighter, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is to be a person who takes part in a resistance movement against an oppressive political or social regime. So let me suggest a few names from our lifetime and before that you will that will help you understand what we're talking about. How about Nelson Mandela, mm-hmm. Mahatma Gandhi, and later his wife Indira, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, William Wilberforce, Susan B. Anthony, and so many more. Each doing what they thought best to ensure that the systems we put in place in our societies afford liberty and justice for all. They wanted a level playing field. Um, Some of these lived in nations where uh, it was divided social, (coughs) economic, some, um, gender, some, by the color of your skin. So they wanted a level playing field for all. Think what you may about each one of these individuals, but one thing they had in common was a conviction to do what they could, what they thought was right and true to bring that to to place. Sometimes, however, we fail to recognize the Apostle Paul in the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Jesus Christ. He fought for the freedoms and liberties of the Gentile church. It was by revelation of Christ himself that Paul received this mantle of leadership and expansion in the Gentile church. You know, when God calls you to do something, you dare not refuse, right? It was a mandate of old given to the Jews first. That's why they had a court of Gentiles in the temple. They were to be a light to a dark world. But now, with Paul, there was new life and new purpose. He actually had the conviction to do what Christ told him to do. So many of us fall back. We think, oh, that's way too big for me. I can't do that. But Paul believed Christ, just like Abraham. And it was credited to him as righteousness. It's a mandate of old. According to Scripture in Acts 10, Peter also was given that mandate in part to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He said, don't call any animal I place before you unclean in the vision. Peter did that some, but not to the same extent of Paul. This mandate is still in effect today for all believers to bring about liberty, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. That is still the commission of the Christ. For Paul, to defend liberty is defend truth. The two cannot be separated for Paul. He says, it is truth that will make you free. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father apart from me. And in John 8, 36, he's recorded as saying, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The book of Galatians is Paul's cry to an injustice being perpetrated to all his converts to Christianity, his sons and daughters of faith who were uncircumcised, those in the Gentile world, those coming out of foreign religions, those having absolutely no understanding of Jewish ritual or the Jewish law or any understanding of the writings of of the prophets. This should be our heart cry. You know, when Cindy says, oh, tonight starts the Day of Atonement for the Jews. Is our heart cry to pray that they would know the one who is atonement, 
Jesus Christ himself as Messiah? Is that our heart's cry? Do we cry and pray for the Jewish people as they cried and prayed for us to come to know Christ early on? Those Jewish believers. You know, the first church was compromised of Jews. They're the ones who spread the gospel to a world that didn't know the Christ. And yet so often we ignore that call to pray for the Jewish believers. Patrick Henry is quoted as saying in Virginia in 1775, Give me liberty or give me death. It's a very popular quote. There's freedom in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's worth fighting for on behalf of those who don't know him. Those who can't fight for themselves. It's not just a social gospel. It actually is a spiritual gospel that will set them free for eternity. And we need to remember that. Yeah. It is good to help social needs. It's really good to meet those needs. But if we don't extend something that will bring them life into eternity, it's worthless. Yeah. And it will be burned up. You see, the cry of Jesus is, for your liberty, I have died. Yes. We need to remember that. We as believers in Christ, we need to remember the cost at which our freedom came. And it should be celebrated with so much more fervor than we celebrate our own 4th of July. Mm. Amen. That's why we meet together to celebrate what Christ has done. As an act of gratitude, our very lives, the things we say, the things we do, should show the truth of a changed life in Christ. It's not enough to say, yes, Jesus, I believe you, and then go out and live like a hellion. It doesn't work. We need to let the Christ change us from the inside out. Amen. You see, we need to be people living as one fully aware and dependent upon the grace of Christ Jesus alone. Paul confirms this reality when he writes to the Ephesians, when he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, so that you can't boast about the works you've done. It's not enough. Yeah. You can't just work your way to heaven. But you know, when growth comes, so do infiltrators. Anytime you have a move of freedom, you will find an enemy coming in trying to shackle you once again. Just as a recap, Paul's writing this letter to the church in Galatia who's fairly young in their faith in Christ. They may have been easily impressed upon by those who are more mature in the faith or who know more things. Sometimes that can be intimidating. If somebody knows more and you think, oh, well, John, they just must be stupid or something that I didn't know. No, we can't be intimidated. Faith is real. Faith in Jesus Christ is real. Religion only looks real. There's a difference. There has to be a reality. Sometimes it's hard to tell that difference. And this was a struggle for the Galatians because they were new and immature. Here's the thing about religion. It makes sense to our minds because it's something that we it's, a, it's something that we can actually um, understand and do. You know, we're great doers, especially in our country. We're so independent. We're such great doers. Oh, we see need? Let's just do it. Let's just fill it. So we're great doers. But faith is not sensible to the human mind. Faith grows here. It grows from the inside out. And it doesn't always make sense. But it's the only thing. Faith in Christ is the only thing that will get us into the kingdom of God for eternity. Amen. Everywhere there is a true move of God. The religion of man will try and take over. There must be a formula for this. I must have to go up here and do that. Or I, you know, do certain gestures. Or I have to pray a certain way. I'll tell you, some of the most inspiring prayers to me are those of a new believer. Because they don't yet know how to pray, you know, as we know how to pray. They just pray what's on their heart. Amen. And they just trust that, you know, God will do it. But then we mature and we forget how to be childlike in our faith, right? 
Everywhere there's a true move of God, religion of man will try and take over, and if that is allowed, faith will falter. We cannot allow religion to overtake us. You know? I believe God did something here at this altar when people stepped out and actually worshipped him today. Amen. We may not understand what it is, but I believe chains were broken. Yes. If faith is not undergirded and defended rightly, the false will infiltrate fully and they'll cause a perverted form of truth, or what Paul calls a contrary gospel. Following the acceptance of what is contrary to Christ, bondage will come. It may look like legalism, liberalism, paganism, animism, any sort of ism. Is man's attempt at religion. Paul was doing just fine sharing the gospel among the Gentiles. There was an explosion. Many were coming to faith. It wasn't until after 14 years at this time where he has to go and straighten it out with the council that Paul even returns to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. He needs to meet with the leaders there. You'll find that in Galatians 2.1. So he goes with Barnabas, son of encouragement. From early on, Barnabas associated with the Gentiles. Everywhere he went, he grew people up. He grew them into maturity in their faith. He recognized the call on people's lives, and he wasn't afraid to promote it. He was a guy who didn't like the limelight on him. He wanted to make everyone else shine and live up to their full potential. That's Barnabas. He mentored Paul. He mentored John Mark. He mentored Titus and so many more. We all need to have somebody in our life who just says, you can do this. Here's, the, here's who Christ is. Let me help you to walk out his call. We read about this event of going up to the council of the first church in Acts 15. So it's really important to know some, some of the uh, letters we see are undergirded by the actual accounts of the early church. And this one is actually in Acts 15. 15 verse 4 says and when they arrived at Jerusalem Paul and Barnabas and Titus when they arrived at Jerusalem they were received by the church and the apostles and elders and they reported all that God had done with them mm -hmm. they gave an account they gave glory to God for all of the converts that had happened in these pagan nations specifically Galatia Galatians 2.2 2 says this It was because of a revelation, Paul says, that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. See, Paul was a man under God's authority. He went to the three pillars of the church, Peter, James, the brother of the Lord, and John, the beloved, before addressing anyone else. Paul received this by revelation, direction from the Lord that he should go. He was a man who did nothing on his own or had his own agenda any longer. That all changed on the Damascus Road. You see, when you have a real-life encounter with Christ, you're willing to just put aside your own understanding, your own agenda, so that you can do his. He willingly shared with those leaders how he preached. Christ Jesus, Son of God, came to die for the sin of the world. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross as an atonement for sin, a full payment. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again. He appeared to over 500 people before he ascended to the right hand of the Father God. He bestowed his Holy Spirit on his followers to comfort, to lead, and to help. Jesus is coming again as conqueror and king to take from the world those are his own. And this gospel was being preached and accompanied by signs and wonders. You see, Paul didn't just speak it. Paul actually did it. He allowed Holy Spirit to flow through him. He had this private meeting so that no seeds of discontent and malice could rise up and disrupt what was going on. He didn't want those seeds sown by those who were bothering the Galatian believers. They were so busy spreading lies regarding salvation. 
The false brethren, in essence, were saying, you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. These pretenders were sent to disrupt. They were envious and they were jealous of the expansive growth among the Gentiles. We need to celebrate what's going on around us rather than be envious and jealous. Those churches were growing rapidly and powerfully. And they were trying to sow, these Judaizers were trying to sow seeds to disrupt what God was doing. Satan is always trying to get you to doubt. Mm -hmm. Always. He's always trying to get you to add works to your faith. Always. Because he wants to detract from the work of Christ in your life. See, we're no different. We need to be aware of his schemes. The weapon that these Judaizers wielded was circumcision for all. Circumcision was an important Jewish rite. It was very important. It was handed down from the days of Abraham. Submitting to circumcision, however, meant obeying the whole Jewish law. Now remember, these were pagans. They had come out of a pagan religious system. How would they even know what the Jewish law is? And Christ Jesus came to fulfill the law. We walk with Christ. But you see, these infiltrators, they forgot the true meaning of circumcision. Old Testament scripture tells us in Deuteronomy that we're to circumcise our hearts so that our neck will be stiff no longer. In Jeremiah 4, when he's speaking to the exiles, he says, Return to me. Put away your detestable things. Live in truth and justice and righteousness. Circumcise yourselves. Remove the foreskins of your heart. You see, for these Judaizers, circumcision had become one had become one of those idols. They had taken what was a true Jewish rite, and they have turned it into an idol. See, circumcision is about getting rid of the unnecessary flesh, the nature of man, the loose parts that try and cling to us, that keep us from walking in the ways of God. That's circumcision. In Romans 2, we read that true circumcision is following the spirit of of the law. What a better way to do it than to walk with Christ in the presence of his presence. Amen? Amen. So these detractors are worth silencing once and for all, and that's why Paul is there. He came to the pillars of the church, those of reputation, that he might not run in vain. Here's the thing. Paul was not uncertain of himself. He was not uncertain of the gospel of Christ that he was sharing. What he wanted to do was make sure that the council was on the side of truth. He met in private to get their backing, to make sure they were on the same page before meeting with the entire assembly. That's why he went to the council. It's always better to go to the leader first and say, hey, tell me about this. Before you ever start sowing seeds of doubt, before you ever start, you know, questioning things, go to the leader. Infiltrators, these Judaizers, they were sent to destroy. Their desire is to destroy. You see, in a race, there's false starts. And if those false starts are not corrected, we've all seen swim meets, we've all seen track meets, we've all seen horse races, we've all seen auto races. You know, if a false start is not corrected, the wrong victor wins the race, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't want the wrong victor. And then there's confusion, there's division, there's antagonism. We don't need to have false teachers in the church. This is the spirit of Antichrist. <laughs> Paul is recognizing this, and he's setting out to silence the voices of falsehood. Let's go to verse 3. Not even Titus, who was with me, though he was Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Verse 5. Mm -hmm. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain in you. Mm -hmm. 
Paul makes no bones about it. These guys snuck in just to destroy the work of the Lord and to take them captive. Peter stands up in defense of grace through faith. You'll see that in Acts 15, verses 7 through 12. You can study that out later. Peter stands up in defense of grace through faith. And he says this, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart. He bore witness to them. He gave them the Holy Spirit. He made no distinction between them and us, <clears throat> cleansing them by faith. Why do you choose to put a yoke around their neck that not even we could bear? We believe we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way they are also. You see here, Peter is vindicating Paul. But why did Paul take Titus, a Gentile believer, with him? Any thoughts, any ideas? Why would he take a Gentile, uncircumcised believer with him to meet with the council? to move in power according to what God had called him to do. The Holy Spirit will work through one who is devoted to Christ, yet uncircumcised. And Titus had a powerful ministry alongside Paul, and eventually on his own. Spoiler alert, James, on behalf of the council, agreed. If you go down to Acts 15, 19, it says, Therefore... In my judgment, we do not trouble those who are turning to God from the Gentiles. That's how it ended. John MacArthur has this to say about the Judaizers. These professing Jewish believers developed a hybrid faith that was true neither to traditional Judaism, as it accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah, nor to apostolic Christianity because it demanded circumcision and obedience to Mosaic law. It is impossible, John MacArthur says, to be a legalist and a Christian. To do a single thing to earn salvation is to vitiate or to spoil grace. They infiltrated the meetings again in order to disturb. Let me just share a story that illustrates this. Although he follows no rules, we know Satan attacks on three fronts. Through the flesh, through the world, and by direct assault. In 1936, Spanish Civil War, Franco's Loyalist Army defeated the Republican Army. It was the key battle of the war, and it led to the establishment of Franco's government in Spain. When asked what the key to his victory was, he replied, the fifth column. He had four columns of troops that were assigned to openly engage, and a fifth column that he used, a fifth column of royalists, inside the lines of the opposing army. Infiltrators, who, through sabotage, seriously weakened the Republican army. Satan has a fifth column, the sinful passions that reside within us. That desire to say, I can do it myself. It's inside every human being. I can do this myself. If I just work harder, if I just try harder, if I just pray harder, if I just study harder, I can do it myself. And Paul's saying that's hogwash. He says, we're not yielding in subjection to them for even one hour. Because we want the truth of the gospel to remain in you. We need to appreciate what Paul has done for the church people. His never surrender attitude in the face of adversity and falsehood is the very thing that we need to be reminded of when times get tough. When the lies and the agendas of compromise in our government, in our school system, mm -hmm. and yes, even in some of our churches, when those things come, we must rise up and stand for truth Amen. because truth prevails. Paul stood for liberty of the gospel and so should you and I. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. Mm -hmm. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Mm -hmm. And then Paul receives an apostolic commendation. I'm just going to read verses 6 through 10. But from those who are of high reputation, what they may, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. I think that's a word for each one of you here. God shows no partiality. He called you, he made you just the way you are, and he gave you a specific task. He shows no partiality. Well, those who are of reputation contributed nothing to me, but on the contrary, Seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcision, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be the pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Paul could have flaunted his credentials in front of them all. You remember, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees and studied under the great rabbi Gamaliel. He could have said, look, this is who I am. But he didn't. We also know from reading in Acts that he could out-debate just about anybody. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do it. You see, because when Christ came into his life, he gladly set aside all his credentials, mm -hmm. all his earthly understanding, so that Christ could bring the truth that lay underneath what it was he had learned, what it was he had been taught. To keep those things and enrich those things that he were taught correctly and to get rid of the things that detracted from the Christ. He set it aside. So when these spies came into the church trying to disrupt the believers, he didn't care about anyone's reputation. He just didn't care. He didn't care about their status. The only thing he cared about was the fact that they were leading people astray and needed to be corrected. Sometimes you and I get too caught up in titles. We have this give honor to where honor is due mentality, and a lot of it is based on titles. But we need to remember, what is God's way of order? Who has he given authority to? Who has he anointed to do something? And sometimes you're going to be the very one in that position, and you can't fall under fear based on someone's title or their reputation. As one of my elders once said recently, leadership is hard but it's necessary. Be a leader. Whatever God has asked you to do, you need to just do according to his way. Paul understood well his call and that it was not his own desire but it was the call of God himself. He understood it and he went with it by the power of the Holy Spirit because of the grace of Jesus Christ, the council could understand that he was entrusted with that call to the uncircumcised. They understood it, and they said, okay. This call was not a call to convert people on the outside like the Judaizers wanted to. It was a call to give them such good news that they changed from the inside out and that everything in their life was new and fresh, and they, that's what they would share with others. That's why the church grew. That's why the church expanded and exploded. It was such good news that it changed the heart. And it spilled out, impacting everyone around them. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So they gave wholehearted approval to Paul and the ministry that God had entrusted him with. Galatians 2 9 says, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me Bar and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. 
God gives us special grace to walk out the calling of life, whatever it is. And we're not in competition with one another. We support those going out one way, even though we're going out another way. And we celebrate, like I said. When he prompts you to reach out and share life with someone, you share the good news of Jesus Christ. You pray for someone when you need to pray for someone. He provides the grace to do it, no matter what some, even if you don't know the right words. Right? We've got to get over ourselves. We're just not all that important. That we have to have the right words. Because out of this gift of grace flows joy and peace and righteousness. Multiplication comes. Only God's grace could make the explosion of the gospel among the Gentiles happen. These three pillars gave to me signifies they were the ones that the Judaizers recognized as the leaders of the church. And so they went to those three first because that would finalize what the Judaizers thought should happen. So he went there. There's no doubt in the eyes of the Judaizers that Paul's call and mission was affirmed by these three pillars. And then, not only were they affirmed, they were given the right hand of fellowship. They were recognized as partners in sharing the gospel. They were on the same par as these three, according to these three. So just remember the poor, see their practical needs. That's not a burden. It shouldn't be a burden for us either, because turn to Acts 4 with me. And I'm just finishing up. I'm almost done, so thanks for holding in there. Acts 4. Listen to this. Starting at verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed, this is the first church, the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one as they had need. That's what we do as a family. We help one another out. That's why Heidi asked for help in taking her dad to his appointment. And I know that for whoever does that, there's going to be an opportunity that you never saw coming. You see, with the rapid expansion, the need for resources was great in Jerusalem. There were so many poor and needy. So this was a joy for Paul to do. Now there's parting words. The Italian freedom fighter, Garibaldi, offered his men only hunger and death to free Italy. Garibaldi had an incredibly committed volunteer army. He would appeal for recruits in these terms. He says, I offer neither pay, nor quarters, nor provisions. I offer hunger and thirst, forced marches, battles, and death. Let him who loves his country with his heart and not with his lips only follow me. These directions were not so different from what Jesus told his followers. He said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. You will have nowhere to lay your head. In this world you will face trials and tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul, compelled by the Spirit of Christ, signs up for service. And he states, That I may know him and the power of res his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. See, this is the payment for those who are serious about following Jesus Christ, about walking with him. There's no guarantees except eternity. But we need to ask ourselves, what gospel am I sharing? Am I sharing a Christ alone gospel? Or am I sharing 
a Jesus plus gospel. You and I must spend the time necessary in fellowship with the Christ, reading the written word, feasting in his presence, that we might recognize and silence the foe as we march onward, taking as many as possible with us into the eternal kingdom of God himself. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you for what you have done, that you have given us faith and grace. Your great kindness has led us to redemption. And we thank you that you have had mercy upon us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have reached out into the Gentile world that we might know you and the power of your resurrection. And now, Lord, once again, we continue to pray for your people, the Jewish nation. And we ask, Lord God, that they would recognize you, that they would see their king, and that they would know you. Help us, O oh Lord, to keep our ear to your breast, to understand and know what you're asking us to do, and give us the courage to take a stand and to walk in it, as Paul did. Glorify yourself through this body, in Jesus' name.